Easter blessings to each of you as we gather virtually to worship the risen Christ here at Chester Presbyterian Church. How awesome that Easter in the church is not just one day, but a whole season. And so we are still celebrating the good news of the resurrection today, and we will continue to do so for the next several weeks. Today, we will consider one of Jesus' post-resurrection encounters with his disciples. And in particular, it is Thomas that draws our attention today. Perhaps the story of Thomas will nudge us to be more comfortable with asking a few questions that can in turn lead us to a deeper faith. And so let us prepare our hearts for worship now as John leads us in doing so through the gift of music. Friends, we are reminded once again that the season of Easter continues, and so let us call one another to worship, beginning with the familiar Easter acclamation. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The risen Christ stands among us, inviting us to a new life. Blessed be the God of hope who brings life even from death. Our hearts are glad and our souls rejoice in the good news of God's faithfulness. Let us then worship God in the joy of this new day. Let us pray together. God of infinite possibilities, you have given us living hope through the power of the resurrection. We praise you for this wondrous miracle of life, for in your great mercy, the risen Lord comes to us breaking through our locked doors to confront our doubts. Help us to see signs of your resurrected presence in our world and in our lives. Transform our doubts and breathe life into our faith so that we, like Thomas, may boldly proclaim, my Lord and my God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Children are naturally inquisitive, aren't they? always asking questions. A child's curiosity is seemingly insatiable. It kind of seems a shame that as we grow up, we lose that tendency towards curiosity. Why is that? What might we learn from our scripture today about the life-giving approach of not having all the answers, of even being comfortable sitting with the questions? Perhaps this video for the child in each of us will prepare us to embrace the questions today. Pastor Donna, it's Ada. I have a question about your sermon 
about Thomas. Questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have some questions about today's sermon. I'm and by I have some questions about today's sermon, she meant great job with today's sermon. It was clear as day. No questions here, thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, God bless now. <gasps> Victor, what are you doing? Oh, nothing much. Just trying to keep you from getting kicked out of church forever. Kicked out of church? I was just asking a question about the sermon. The sermon was completely clear. Do not ask questions. Ever. For any reason. I don't think that was the point of the sermon. You heard how Thomas is viewed in the modern church. It's a doubter. A non-believing doubter who has too many questions. But... Good uh, Christians who are confident in their faith don't need to waste time asking questions. But what if... Yeah! No questions! Hey, guys. What are you talking about? Victor says we'll get kicked out of church if we ask questions. They'll kick me out of church if I ask a question? Phrase it as a statement, Clara. They'll kick me out of church? That's still a question. What's that, Monty? <clears throat> Pastor Donna, if Jesus was the sa- Not cool, Monty. Not cool at all. No questions. Gotcha. Are you a secret agent? Pastor Donna? Oh, no. If the Trinity is the Father, the Son- Huh? Everyone, please, stop sabotaging yourselves with all these questions. Can we ask if we whisper? No. Can we at least think about questions? No. Can I chew on it for a while? Stop! Stop! You will get us all excommunicated! What's extra communicated? No more questions! Victor, are you okay? No! Victor, if we can't ask questions, how are we going to learn anything? Ada, that is a good question. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, continue to remove the stones that block the portals of our minds. Fill our thoughts and our hearts that we may move beyond being hearers of your good news and on to telling and being and doing the work to which you call us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails on his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet to come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in just a brief moment of prayer? Let us pray. Gracious God, continue to be among us today. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might see you and experience you and that that experience might transform our very lives. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable to you on this day and all days. Amen. Well, in our text this morning that Wendy just read, we meet one who is familiar perhaps to all of us, the one who has been come to be known by many as Doubting Thomas. But here's the thing, I think that Thomas has gotten a bad rap. In fact, Thomas is someone that I can actually relate to. And perhaps we will discover that he is someone that we can all relate to today. We learned from the text that Thomas has been absent when Jesus first appeared to the disciples in the locked room on that Easter Sunday evening. He hadn't seen Jesus with his own eyes, and when the others tell him the news, he can't believe it. Not without seeing as they have seen. You know what? Who can blame him? After all those other disciples, they didn't believe what Mary told them either. They didn't believe until they saw Jesus for themselves. And if we're honest with ourselves, wouldn't most of us react as Thomas did? Who among us wouldn't jump at the chance to experience what Thomas experienced? Most of us, no matter what is said about how blessed it is to believe without seeing, most of us want to see first, don't we? So I think Thomas actually speaks for all of us when he asks for some tangible proof. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, Thomas said, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. Thomas has what I call a healthy skepticism, and that, friends, is what I think most of us can relate to. As I was growing up in, in my church, this story, the, the story of doubting Thomas, as it was called then, well, it was used as sort of a hammer to attempt to drive home the nail of faith to me. The point seemed to be that faith was good and doubt was bad. But I, like the cartoon characters in our video today, I had a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of unresolved doubt. 
You see, in the faith tradition that I grew up in, questions were discouraged. And so when I couldn't ask my questions at church, I looked elsewhere. I signed up for a world religions class in high school. And then again in college, I took another world religions class. During those years, I was probably a lot like Thomas. And as a result of my question asking, well, I came to have a healthy appreciation for doubt. Through my experience, I came to understand that faith and doubt, they're not opposites. In fact, according to Paul Tillich, one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century, he says doubt is not the opposite of faith. Rather, doubt is an element of faith itself. And I can tell you for sure that that certainly was validated in my own experience. Those doubts and those questions that I had then, and admittedly that I still sometimes have today, they have been actually a catalyst for me to a deeper faith. As I look back on my faith journey, the times that my faith grew the most were the times that I questioned what I assumed that I already knew. And as a result, I've come to embrace doubt and questions as companions for my faith journey. At several points in my faith journey, I believe that doubt, the the doubt that I experienced was actually, it was actually a gift from God. A nudging, if you will, of the Holy Spirit for me to reconsider my belief system. And so I've come to understand and appreciate that God indeed works through both faith and through doubt. Perhaps that is exactly how Thomas felt as he reflected back on what happened that Sunday evening. Thomas doesn't believe what he's told. He demands proof. And notice what Jesus does. Just notice, go back and read the scripture. He doesn't rebuke Thomas. He doesn't lecture Thomas. Jesus makes room for Thomas's doubt. And then he responds by inviting Thomas to see, even, even to touch the wounds of the crucifixion. Oh, and as a result, Thomas is able to find his faith. But what about the original readers of of John's gospel who have not been able to see for themselves? What about us today? Thomas could demand to see first because, well, there was still some seeing to be done then. Not for the generations of us who followed, though. How are we to believe when we don't get to have the same experience of seeing what Thomas and the other disciples saw? Well, in today's world, I believe it's much harder for us to take things on faith because we're so good at finding tangible or at least scientific proof for so many things. We can prove so much with our God-given minds Why shouldn't we be able to prove God, to prove Jesus? It would seem that there's not much we believe today without proof. Well, except what we read on social media. Some folks seem to take that as gospel. But I digress back to our story. You know, I have to say that I still struggle with trust and faith, even when it relates to things that I can see. I struggle with knowing or not knowing how complicated technology works. For instance, every time I make my way down the aisle to take my assigned seat on an airplane, well, at that moment, I really wish I knew more about the laws of physics and aerospace engineering. I really wish I knew more about how something that big, filled with all of those people and their luggage, can completely defy gravity and lift off to fly like a bird. 
If I had just paid more attention when they covered the laws of physics in school, perhaps my doubts wouldn't be so pervasive. If I just pursued a career in aerospace engineering, I would feel more comfortable trusting and believing that a plane will in fact lift from the runway and transport me to my intended destination. Indeed, don't even the tangible things of life, the things that we can see and touch and feel, don't they give us pause even sometimes? How then are we to make any sense and have any comfort when it comes to the apparent intangible things of life, like faith in God? Perhaps once again, the story of Thomas can inform us on our journey. For centuries, you see, this story and other stories of faith have been passed down from generation to generation, coming alive for each one of us in our own time. Today, we have the gift of these stories, these testimonies, these witnesses in the form of Scripture. It was Barbara Brown Taylor, the great preacher and author and professor, who aptly called the gift of Scripture the message our ancestors rolled up and put in a bottle for us because they wanted us to experience the person of Jesus, if not in the flesh, than in the word. And from our text today, Jesus assures us, even blesses us, when he shares that seeing and believing, oh, it's not superior to hearing and believing. And so, are we merely expected to hear and believe? The fact is that some of us do hear and believe. It's just as simple as that. Others of us, perhaps most of us, want more than just words on a page or stories passed down through the generations. Perhaps our sentiment, our frustration with wanting to see like Thomas is best expressed in a poem that was written by Norman Shirk of which I have taken poetic license to modify just a bit. And so here the poem by Norman Shirk. Let me meet you on the mountain, Lord, just once. You wouldn't have to burn a whole bush, just a few branches. And I would surely be your Moses. Let me meet you by the well, Lord, just once. You wouldn't have to tell this woman everything I've ever done. Just share with me a cup of your living water, and I would surely be your evangelist. Let me meet you on the water, Lord, just once. It wouldn't have to be on the James or the Rappahannock. Just a puddle after a spring shower, and I would surely be your Peter. Let me meet you in the garden, Lord, just once. You wouldn't have to call me by name. Just let me hear your voice. And I would surely be your Mary. Let me meet you on the road, Lord, just once. You wouldn't have to blind me in the middle of Route 10. Just a few bright lights on the way to church. And I would surely be your Paul. Let me meet you, Lord, just once, anywhere, anytime. Just meeting you, meeting you in the word is so hard sometimes. Must I always be your Thomas? Friends, the good news is that even in our modern society, so far removed from these stories of real-life encounters with the risen Christ, even today we can still see and believe. Indeed, there is evidence even today of the resurrected Christ in our midst. For we encounter the risen Christ in every experience of forgiveness 
and reconciliation. In every relationship that's repaired and renewed, in every experience of death leading to new life, in the joy of of welcoming a child into our families and into the faith community through baptism, in every vibrant ministry and mission of love and grace around the world. The risen Christ is present. The experience of resurrection and and new life is present in so many ways, large and small. And all of these moments point to the one who gives life, to the one who raised Jesus up on the third day. Leonardo Boff, one of the best known of Latin America's early liberation theologians, speaks to how the presence of the risen Christ is realized even today. He puts it this way, the resurrection is a process that began with Jesus and that will go on until it embraces all of creation. Wherever love is getting the better of selfish interest and wherever hope is resisting the lure of cynicism and despair, there the process of resurrection is being turned into a reality. You see, what Boff suggests is the same thing that John seems to suggest in our lesson for today. And that is that God is not finished with humanity yet. Through the resurrection, we are confronted with the surprising news that the creative imagination of God is still loose in the world. What happens to Thomas and the disciples is that they become participants in the imagination of God. And certainly their ministry that follows confirms this. The good news is that the resurrection isn't something that happened a long, long time ago, something that we just merely commemorate on Easter. In our day-to-day lives, in, in the church and ministry, we are called to put our hands on the brokenness of the world and to witness to the hope that sustains us, even even in the midst of our own questions and doubts. For just as Jesus invited Thomas then, he invites us today to reach out and touch the wounds of suffering and death in our world, to encounter the living Christ and to proclaim, just like Thomas, my Lord and my God, How will we respond to Christ's patient invitation to us as his disciples today? Will we share the good news of life that we have discovered in his name with everyone that we meet? Will we, through the power of the Spirit, join in God's continuing creative work of ministry today? Will we continue to unlock our doors to feed those that are hungry? Will we respond to those without adequate housing or a living wage? Will we care for those that are imprisoned by the circumstances of life? For if we will, oh, we will indeed see Christ in our midst. And if we will, the reality of resurrection will become more than words on a page or stories passed down through the generations. Blessed indeed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. For through believing, we may become part of life. Life in Jesus' name. And that, friends, is the Easter blessing that we are invited to embrace. Alleluia. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I remind you that the names of those on our prayer list are included in our bulletin and our weekly email. And if you are not receiving that and would like to, please contact our church office and Marcy can make sure that happens. 
But I hope that in the days coming this week that you will include those on our prayer list in your personal daily prayers, in addition to lifting them up now as we join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. O holy and eternal God, for many the celebration of Easter Day is past. The lilies have faded and the alleluias are dying away. Open our minds, O God, that we might begin to understand that in Christ every day is Easter. That even today the risen Christ stands in our midst, ready to guide and empower us, ready to welcome our questions and to speak peace. Indeed, as you come to us in this hour with your life-giving grace, open our hearts and our minds for ongoing encounters with the risen Christ. In friends and in strangers, in dreams and visions, in songs and scriptures, in words and in silence. Breathe Easter life into us such that we may be your enlivened, inspirited, true church, united as one to share your good news in word and in deed. And as you have summoned us to share in your work in the world, so equip us, we pray, to be passionate, committed disciples, ones who, like Thomas, would dare to boldly proclaim our faith in you even in the midst of our own questions and doubt. O living Lord, some of us come to you with the weary of stress and strain of our days. We seek rest that only you can give. Others come with hearts heavy from grief over the loss of loved ones. Still others seek healing from physical emotional or spiritual pain. All of us come praying for peace in the midst of tumultuous situations around our world. We know that you hear our prayers, O God, and that you understand when we suffer. We thank you that you do not leave us alone in the moments of of greatest need, but that you seek us out that you find us where we are, that you stand with us in the midst of our suffering until we can experience your peace. Help each of us to remain open to your grace, even now as we join our voices together as one, to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God invites us to share the fullness of who we are with the world. It is indeed a holy invitation. And so now, as the gift of music is offered, we pause to consider how we will respond to God with our resources and with our very lives.
Let us pray. Pour out your spirit upon our offerings, O God, that in giving of ourselves and our gifts, the whole world may come to know the joy of Easter. Multiply our collective efforts so that Christ's mission may spread to wherever there is need. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, Christ continues to come among us even today, encouraging us and nudging us to embrace curiosity and to grow in our faith. And so peace be with you all as you continue to rejoice in the good news of Easter. In the name of God who calls each of us beloved, in the name of the risen Christ who shows us the way, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who is with us always. Alleluia. Amen.